It's the Gold Mike Podcast, where the mic is gold, and this is a podcast. I'm your host, Mark Paul, and today we got this guy, Bishop Lamore Miller Whitehead. Okay, so we all heard about or seen the video where the preacher was in the middle of his sermon live streaming on Facebook and at least three men entered his church and robbed him of his ju- him and his wife of his jewelry and it just had me thinking like who is this guy like why would somebody want to rob this dude like there's 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 more to the to the to the story than we probably know i know a lot of people are saying that he set it up himself and that somebody in the church set it up himself and that you know this is all just like a a scheme just for insurance money for the jewelry um but we all don't know you know it's all just speculation but through all this speculation i was just wondering like who is this guy who is Bishop Lamar Miller Whitehead and I went to his website and they have like a a brief summary about the guy on his website so I'm gonna go ahead and read some of some of the uh things that was said and this is according to his website for his church so I'm gonna go ahead and read it I'm not gonna show the the text I'm going to just go ahead and read everything. All right. So it reads Bishop Lamar Miller Whitehead, radical, revolutionary, innovative, anointed and cutting edge. Some of those are some of the words often used to describe Bishop Miller Whitehead, Lamar Miller Whitehead. He is a dynamic preacher, motivational speaker social activist, community leader, entrepreneur, Bishop Lamar Miller Whitehead is a visionary with a shepherd's heart whose influence has made an impression both in the church and in the world. Hmm, that's a that's a hell of a of an introduction. So let's just get into the meats in the of 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 you know who this guy is. Uh, so he was born in Brooklyn and he was raised with it with a loving mo- mother who was forced to be a mother and a father as a result of a murder of Bishop Whitehead's father okay so he's a guy that grew up without his father uh, apparently his uh, father was murdered um, his father uh, name was Arthur Miller a politician and community activist interesting so his father was a community activist and on june 14 1978 he was brutally beaten and strangled by 16 police officers which resulted in ultimately his unjust death that's interesting that is so interesting so his father was a politician community activist and he was killed by police wow that's 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 something um and this occurred when he was just six months old so basically his whole life he grew up you know without a father it was just him and his mother um but it continues to say uh bishop whitehead have devoted his life in the ministry towards assisting and in the empowerment of the community and to lead it as an example of how God can turn pain into purpose all right growing up as a young man on the mean streets of Brooklyn it wasn't easy Bishop Whitehead found himself in a placement that many young men are faced with today being raised in a single parent home without a father and expected to survive in a world that was designed for him to fall in still through it all bishop whitehead managed to finish high school as a 
celebrated athlete okay so he plays sports in school and went on to score at academic scholarships with Shaw University uh, and a few other universities where he studied accountant and videography okay so he has a educational background of accounting and videography okay so Bishop Whitehead attended New York Theolog theological sim sim I don't know how to say all of that and completed his studies with a certificate in ministries in human services okay so they, they jump into when he um, uh, was acquiring I guess to get his license to be a preacher and as a new licensed New York chaplain and a certified marriage and funeral officiant okay so they kind of like jump from his childhood you know in, in the middle you know brought in college and now they're talking about him you know getting his certifications and um you know trying to become a a, a preacher uh, perhaps okay so i'm gonna skip some of this let me scroll through some of this and um it's, it continues to talk about one of the most challenging times in bishop whitehead's life came from when he was illegitimately illegally convicted and sentenced to 11 and one third to 34 years so it says that he was illegally convicted and sentenced to 11 and three-thirds to 34 years in prison hmm that's interesting how it says illegally okay this presented itself to be one of the most pivotal points in his life where Bishop Whitehead's face what faith was surely tested this experience challenged him daily to stand on everything he knew about God so this is giving like the impression that you know while he was in his studies to be a minister or a preacher or, or whatever he wanted to become he was involved in criminal activity interesting okay so it does continue and it says whitehead learned to fashion his life as the apostle paul did which is my middle name mark paul <laughs> did during the time of his imprisonment and draw closer to god in his in fictions okay bishop whitehead believed that through this experience his walk in calling in God was solidified and strengthened by the grace of God. Bishop Whitehead served six years in prison. So he was illegally convicted and sentenced to 11, I'm not going to say, and three thirds to 34 years in prison. But he ultimately served six years in prison where he was, uh, he, he was released after his sentence was overturned. So maybe he was illegally convicted since his sentence was overturned. This experience allowed Bishop Whitehead to expand his ministry to include services that speak directly to prisoners servicing lengthy sentences and the youth headed to, and to the youth headed in the wrong direction these glasses make it hard to read his focuses have been to enlighten the youth to prevent them from making the decisions that will alter their destiny all right so he went to prison um served about six years and his sentence was overturned i wonder what the details of that case was since he said that he was illegally sentenced and his and his sentence was overturned that makes me wonder you know what what was the details in his sentence like you know like in, in his case i should say like why was his case overturned that is interesting. That's something I'm, I'm just now learning it. I, I, I haven't, I haven't read this, so I'm 
really just tr- finding all of this out um this that's that's interesting so i'm going to try to figure out the information in regards to his case since he was his his sentence was overturned but i'm getting ahead of myself it said his sentence was overturned it didn't say his conviction was overturned so i kind of really want to know what the details behind that is okay so let me try to find like some information on his case like what what got him locked up what got him locked up Hmm. oh here's something okay i don't i don't know how credible this is but i'm reading this off of a website that i can't see because i had these sunglasses on but it say his conviction arose out of a fraudulent loan scheme the trial established established that he exploited his former girlfriend valerie rodriguez who had access to personal identifying information through a computer credit check program at a baron honda car dealership where she worked oh so he had him a a female on the inside um messing with people's personal business interesting the scheme involved creating fake email accounts voicemail boxes and using stolen identifying information filling out fraudulent loan applications and using these loans to obtain vehicles what that is crazy okay let's um let's continue on may 5th 2005 um a lady by the name of maria i don't know how to say her last name received a phone a telephone call from a loan representative about a recent loan application because she did not apply for a loan she called the police detective investigated and determined that someone took out a loan in her name to purchase a motorcycle at king cycle in brooklyn new york hmm so you mean to tell me this guy uh, was stealing people information and buying stuff off her off of their credit and this is in the middle of his studies of becoming a a minister and a preacher that's 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 quite strange that in the middle of your studies you um get into this type of trouble it's like how do you accidentally get into this type of trouble but let me continue it said the loan included a sales agreement in her name and a copy of her driver's license that had her name but someone else's picture on it so oh wow the person in the photograph was later identified as anita bryant one of his friends so all right so this is a lot so this preacher was accused of stealing people's personal information applying for loans and purchasing vehicles with the with the loan money that he acquired from these people's identity and this is in the middle of his studies to become a preacher interesting and on top of that it show it's, it's it's basically saying that he has fake ids so he over here creating fake ids making applying for loans in other people name in the middle of his studies of being a preacher 
that is so so interesting this is what gives the church a black eye niggas like this gives the church a black eye it's like and it's always a nigga in a shiny suit talking slick just trying to look fly to just you know just get over on people and it's just sad but let me continue on june 7 2005 the detective learned that he had been arrested in manhattan while riding the uh, the motorcycle he purchased in the lady's name so okay okay so this is this is a lot this this guy is clearly burnt out this is all happening in the middle of his studies to become a preacher so he gets into he gets arrested on a motorcycle that was attained by a fraudulent loan and he's a preacher i don't know this is this is kind of hard for me to really process and in the same month the detective traced a phone number on the cell purchase documents of a arrow beep and voicemail service i guess that's i don't i don't know what that is arrow beep maybe there's a beepers maybe no this don't this say the 2000s uh, i think beepers was out so i don't know what arrow beep is um oh yeah it says it. it's a it's a business that provides customers with phone numbers and mail receiving services oh wow this is this guy is crazy so let me scroll through some of this because i don't think some of this stuff is relevant oh okay so it say detectives as for a list of accounts associated um with a phone number i guess that he used i'm kind of lost here and in july he recorded voicemails associated with those accounts the detective discovered that he had an arrow beep account and that several phone numbers used in the fraudulent loan applications were under other arrow beep accounts for example an account in the name of John Wilson purchased 10 numbers. Oh, I get it. I get it. So Arrow Beep is, a, is, is like a, a, a phone services where you can like probably like get multiple extensions and stuff like that. Okay, I kind of get it. Purchased 10 numbers, including the one that was included in the motorcycle sale uh, agreement under Maria's name. Um, on 2000. On August 5th, 2005, the detective sought and obtained a search warrant uh, from the judge for two residents in connection with the identity theft investigation. He seized two computer systems and uh, from systems from one of the house and submitted them to forensic analysis. The detective investigation of telephone and bank records revealed that the personal identifying information of several Baron Honda customers was used to create fraudulent loan applications. So this is not the only person. So Maria is not the only person. So they're basically... Um, the telephone service is what linked him to this scheme um because so those phone numbers were linked to those fraudulent accounts interesting so from january 23rd through the 25th of 2006 the detective and other officers began surveying him his home in new jersey on January 25th, the officers saw the defendant drive his car into New York 
where they arrested him oh okay so they were they were staking his ass out it was like okay he can do what he do in jersey but as soon as he crossed over in new york we got his ass and that's what they did the same day the judge issued a search warrant for his car where officers found documents clothing and three cell phones the document included uh, Con Edison bill, which detectives testify was used as address verification for several false loans. Wow. So this guy was using people's information. Uh, he, he was, he was, he was using fake IDs. Um, he was using, I'm guessing, other people's utility bills to verify. At, oh, this is this guy is 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 a scammer. This guy is 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 by far a scammer, according to what I'm reading here. Let me just say that this guy is a scammer, according to what I'm reading here, and this is very interesting that this is supposed to be a man of god you know this is supposed to be like a leader in the community people look up to pastors people look at them as a an example to perhaps you know base their life behind and it's sad that we come to this where we learn about a preacher whose whose church was robbed and after we find out about all of that stuff there is like a whole lot of other stuff surrounding this guy so let me continue so on january 27th 2006 the detective contacted the police department to obtain the search warrant for his house in new jersey uh, a new jersey detective obtained the search warrant from a municipal court judge and detective gabriel joined officers from the police department to execute the warrant they seized laptops cell phones and various items on january 30th 2006 the courts issued a computer search warrant to search the laptop and the three cell phones. On February 3rd, 2006, he was charged in Suffolk County with one count of attempted identity theft in the first degree and one count of attempted grand larceny in the second degree. His attorney filed a discovery motion see seeking search warrants issued against him his property and affidavits uh returned thereof as well as property photographs and things seized under the warrant so this is what he was ultimately charged with one count of attempted identity theft in the first degree one count of attempted grand larceny in the second degree so this is what he was initially charged with um so let me scroll through some of this let me uh scroll through some of this because some of this just doesn't it, it doesn't make no sense to, to to really uh read um oh here we go Okay, so on April 25th, 2006, they filed a superseding indictment charging him with three other accounts of attempted identity theft in the first degree, one count of attempted grand larceny in the second degree, two counts of identity theft in the first degree, two counts of grand larceny in the third degree, and three counts of unlawful possession of personal identified identification information in the third degree so this guy was hit with a whole lot of charges and in march of 2006 he was indicted in new york county 
for criminal possession of a 2004 Land Rover. The car was searched in connection with the Suffolk County case against him. So this guy here was really, really, really scamming uh, when it comes to this. So it doesn't say that his conviction was overturned, but it does say that his sentence was overturned. And I'm not going to spend too much more time on there. It just, I was just wondering, like, who was this guy? It's like, it, there's, there's there's more to this guy than you know than than just he got robbed you know there's there's a lot going on with this and i know this don't have nothing to do with the robbery but it's just it's just interesting it just seemed like after the robbery there there's like a whole banana that we just pull in apart that there's a whole lot of different information that you know what that just just it's just crazy and then there's also uh reports of him um being sued um so apparently um he is also being sued for ninety thousand dollars for stealing the life savings of a person um that had trouble getting a home loan because they had bad credit. So I don't, and that's one thing I don't get. How do you have $90,000 in bad credit? You need to take that $90,000 and, and try to fix your credit. Then you wouldn't be, but that, that's besides the point. That's a whole nother story. So even after, you know, getting arrested, investigated, arrested, you know, charged, convicted, serving time, getting out. Even after that, he continued to do fuckery. So, I'm not going to spend too much more time on this guy. I just think it's sad that this guy is a preacher that has a church. And he has all of this going on while he's a preacher. And it just saddens me that this is where the church has came to that we have a guy that is literally scamming people and he's a preacher i don't know i really don't know what to think of it but i'm gonna go ahead and end it here this is the gold mic podcast where the mic is gold and this is a podcast i'm your host mark paul and i'm out Shit is crazy.